just have this conversation, (laughs) then that thing will be less sexy. And maybe because of that reality and that rawness and being able to like open yourself up so vulnerably, you'll actually stay together for longer. Back to another episode of Girls Gotta Eat. Welcome back. I am feeling great because I just got the wordle in two tries and I am in my follicular phase of my cycle. So I have energy. I'm what feeling the fuck great. What did you say to me? <laughs> What did you just say? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm learning more about my body. <laughs> I'm going to get a doctor. People were messaging. I'm going to get, get a doctor. People were messaging thing. last week. They were like, I'm like 36 and I need a primary care physician or, you know, stuff like funny stuff like that. It was really funny. Yeah, me too. On my health journey. Yeah, me too. I'm on health journey too. I woke up this morning. I'm just, I haven't been feeling great. I'm out of like my routine. And so I woke up and I worked out for the first time in like six weeks. I don't feel physically right but I feel superior to other people which is <laughs> important and I will do it on Saturday morning and feel exceptionally superior to others I feel superior every day when I do the wordle <laughs> I you would never hear Ashley emote more than when she's doing the wordle I always think there's an emergency like I don't know thunder be, the other night I don't know <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry was that thunder irregular because people were going crazy yes. about it yes I woke up and I thought the city was under attack like, I was like there this was is it it was trending on like TikTok and Twitter and Games everywhere. It got me thinking. I Azul is terrified of thunderstorms. So, I mean, it did wake me up and then he was like crying, but I didn't feel like it was especially loud. But then I thought to myself, I feel like I haven't heard a thunderstorm in a really long time. Um, like, I can't, from prior to that, I was like, I literally don't remember the last time I heard thunder. Is this a climate change situation? So like when you're on your call map, do you, <laughs> <laughs> you heard thunder? Like it was exceptionally <laughs> loud and long. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> like that guy you like fucked. that guy I fucked. <laughs> it come to the live it shows so long come and to the live like shows. a break and they kept going <laughs> <laughs> you would call him a thunderous comer if you will <laughs> we're having fun <laughs> all right Oh my gosh, there is a announcement list, but this it's fun stuff. It's good stuff. It's all fun stuff. One month from today, six, 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 six easy to remember, week of six, nine, sex, 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 sex. We are finally launching the new company. I'm so excited. It's happening. That is the date set in stone. Yeah. We unless can. something crazy happens, but we cannot wait. And honestly, we know some of you guys think you know, but you don't know. It is so big. It's like two companies, actually. Yeah, it's It's like this huge brand. We've worked so hard on it. We've taken all of our money (laughs) (laughs) and and all of our time. We self-funded this. We've spent an entire year year working on this, and we are so proud of it. And we cannot wait to release it to you guys. So that's the date, 6-6. Keep an eye out for it. Yeah, and you'll find out. But again... You don't know. We're about to change the whole you world. You think you know, you don't. You don't know anything. <laughs> but then once you know, you will know. You'll, you will if know. you know, you will and know. And then you will buy it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you will know. Save your money. Um, so anyway, just wanted to tease it. Put it on your calendar. STD. Save the date. And Don't buy anything until then. <laughs> Except tickets to the live shows. Yes. Oh, amazing segue. Okay. Yeah. We have some live shows coming up. And we just got back from um, a weekend in Missouri. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was really fun. We did St. Louis Friday night. We did Kansas City Saturday night. It just, it really was a blast. We have never been to Kansas City. That yeah. theater was absolutely oh incredible. We did the Midland in Kansas City. And in St. Louis, we did the pageant. Um, and it just, we had such a blast. So if you guys came out, thank you so much. Um, the stripper in St. Louis is the biggest dick I've ever seen <laughs> on a human being. It was just <laughs> slapping against my whole body. It was it was really just slinging around. Um, yeah, and we had these incredible dancers in Kansas City, Empire Dance Academy. They were all smoke shows, like such bad bitch, girl power. They opened the show you guys can check them out and i think take classes and stuff empire dance academy in kansas city and yeah we, we loved going there you know while we're here this we were in st louis and nikki glazer is a new show on e uh so you guys can check out her reality show and it's all filmed in st louis so it was like a kind of funny thing because it premiered right the weekend we were there and andrew collin who's been a former guest in the show you guys know andrew he's on it and it's about like her being in st louis with her family and stuff so you guys should check that out yeah especially if you're in st louis how cool is that to like watch it you're like that's my city i know i can't believe we were just there we tried to get 
to come, but they had shows. Oh, yeah, they had shows. And then in Kansas City, if we can give you guys um, a wrap, we stayed at this unbelievable hotel that, like, everybody there says, like, the best hotel there, too. It's called the Crossroads Hotel. And there's just, there's restaurants, there's a rooftop bar. It's, like, really industrial. It's one of my favorite, like, hotel rooms itself. The floors were slate. And Ashley took great nudes there. I go into a hotel, and if it is like a sexy hotel room, especially with a bathroom, especially with a walk-in shower. You know, I hate a tub. I just want a sexy shower to get blowjobs in. Um, <laughs> I take my clothes off immediately. Yeah, I know. You went to the hotel and like Bella was getting ready to go do sound check. And then I was like, what am I going to do for the next like four hours? And I was like, is anybody trying to like come like take a ride with me around Kansas City? Both you were like, I'm good. And you were taking it. So I have like some really sexy bra and panty sets and I don't wear underwear normally, but I've I'm just going to admit this about myself that I'll bring it on the road to take hotel. (laughs) Get the fuck out of here. But actually those full coverage panties I did wear under that dress. So, but I've brought them before just to take photos in because my bedroom and my bathroom are not sexy enough. You are an icon. You plan (laughs) outfits for your nudes. This is crazy. Also, what's the... They're not nudes. What's a better word? I mean, I guess you can see some nipples. Sexy pics. Sexy pics. Yeah. So that bathroom was so sexy and I took some photos you know for my own archives for my own files um but then I did this other thing that I'll talk about I guess because like I'm shower nude queen I took a photo I I did send it to somebody that we like joke we talk about like showers and stuff so I basically because <laughs> we fucked in the shower a lot so i take just a, a guy I joke about showers it's with. a guy i'm <laughs> fucked in the shower trying to fuck in the shower again so i took i brought the lights down a little bit there was like two two light switches i turned one down so it was like low lighting and then i just took a i got naked fully naked and then took a photo basically of the shower and like you could see just a slight reflection in the glass so you could see like the shape of one of my breasts you could kind of see a nipple you could see like where my vagina was you could see the gap between my legs you could see like you could tell there was a if you look closely you could tell there was a body in there and there was a silhouette (laughs) so it was so subtle like I I wouldn't care if it ended up anywhere it was not you couldn't tell who it was it was just like yeah you could send to Raina's dad (laughs) I could send to your dad I sent to my dad no I'm kidding um but (laughs) that's a tip that that's like that's not somebody that I would send a naked photo too so I was like this will be perfect to like you know hopefully get the, the wheels turning but then I went full on like my bra and panty set and like t- took a f- ton of photos I think that it's nice to just get the juices flowing a little bit with somebody that you're not continuously sexting and sending that stuff to but like a subtle nude yeah I'm gonna teach you guys how to take better subtle nudes with the new company with the new company um but I the hotel was incredible I loved like you said this industrial I couldn't get over the floors like the floors had that stone uh-huh. look and then there was like a four poster bed which is sexy to Very hold sturdy. you know if you yes if you, you want to hold get, on to it or like handcuffed to it yeah, yeah everything was great I just like laid in bed and then I got some really delicious food and then I watched that the principles of pleasure is that what's called the mm-hmm. principles of pleasure on Netflix that Raina talked about. But anyway, that is where I learned a little bit more about my period. <laughs> and we want to do an episode about period health yes. and birth control. And Ashley and I have had, you know, long journeys. I have an IUD, you're on birth control. Um, so we are focusing on doing an episode on that soon. Yeah. And I mean, on that note, like not to bring the mood down, but we're recording this right after the Supreme court may be overturning Roe versus Wade. And it's something that I, I I lack like words for it in terms of like how we're regressing in time and like what the GOP has done and like where the Supreme Court is right now. It's like a terrifying place. And so the decision hasn't been made yet, but these court, these docs were leaked and it sounds like that could be something that like, I just hate it because people are like, what's, you know, wh- what's the worst that could happen if we, you know, elect Trump into office? And it's like, I, I don't know, like he ele- he elects three Supreme Court justices that sit there for life and like they try to overturn Ro- Roe versus Wade. But um, it's just it's really devastating. And it's never been about abortion. It's about controlling and criminalizing women's bodies. And it's just so disgusting. And it's like, I'm not trying to be a fear monger, but it, you do have to be like, you never saw this coming. But what's next? It's plan B. It's birth control. Mm-hmm. Like it's always women's health on the chopping block. And it's horrifying and so disgusting and I don't know I mean you know we always say like vote in every election no matter what but it's tough because there's like what else do you do we aren't experts on it you know we're not political commentators but we would be remiss to like not talk about something that's like we've been talking about amongst ourselves all day and like it's we feel so strongly about yeah I mean we both I mean you saw it last night because you stay up later than me but I woke up and you know was immediately filled with 
dread and sadness, I texted Mira, who was on our show, and she did a phenomenal episode for us about abortion. She works with Planned Parenthood. She said she was being pulled into press all day. But, you know, we will work to share resources we can with you guys. Yeah. But other than, you know, just think about who you are voting for and don't ever say to yourself what's the worst that can happen yeah. in short term. You know, people like Donald Trump empower other politicians to do these type of things. And, you know, he's out of office. But there are tons of people in office now that he has put in power and empowered. And it's a very frightening thing. And, you know, if you are afraid, you know, we, we stand by you. And Yeah, and it's not all Trump. Like, I, no, I'm not, you know, I'm not, not. I'm, not, I'm not saying it's that to... one person. Yes, it's, it's, it, this is what the, like, what the Republican Party has been doing forever. And they don't fucking care about the fetuses. You know, like, it's just like, I can't stress that enough. It's not about that. It's never been about that. And I, I can't believe that this could happen and what this would mean. And, you know, there's so many layers and there's so much nuance. This doesn't mean, like... You can't get an abortion tomorrow, but it will make it really hard. And all these states will enact all these insane laws. They're going to criminalize it. It's going to be really bad. And I mean, this everything else that's going on, I mean, it's like, what? Do, where do you even start? Like, we've just gone back in time with, like, the books coming off the shelves and, like, the don't say gay stuff. I mean, it's just, like, really terrifying and it's like sometimes you can't even keep up and then you want to just not look and like not think about it and I was saying to you recently I was like I feel like I used to be so much more posting stuff and activism and all this stuff and like sometimes I'm like I can't digest it all and you look away but I don't want to do that either and we have a platform that we want to use so we always want to strike that balance because this should be an escape and this should be fun and funny but we can't not speak about women's issues especially yeah and you know if you guys have incredible resources we would love to share them and if you have limited access to medical care you know we we stand by you and we will always do whatever we can to to help and at least to uplift the message and share our position on it and whatever else we can so mm -hmm. if you guys have great resources um please share them and, and we'll continue to share for you yeah, you can always Google abortion funds. Yellow Fund is great. Follow them on Instagram, see what they're up to. Um, mm -hmm. You know, everybody kind of thinks of Planned Parenthood, but there's, which is great. We love Planned Parenthood, but there's so much other things to do, especially within your own community. So, okay. Let's talk about places you can still get abortions, and that is Detroit, Indianapolis, and Pittsburgh, where we will be going oh for our God. live shows at the end of the month. Um, so, yeah, get an abortion there and <laughs> come to our live shows. Um, no, this run of shows is really special to me because I yeah. went to college in Indiana and I grew up in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. I'm in Detroit. I have no connection to you, but I'm sure it'll be fun. Eminem. <laughs> yeah, Eminem. Um, <laughs> we've done one show there. We're excited to go back, make a new memory there. Um, and these shows are going to be really fun and special. Pittsburgh, I think, is sold out. But um, Who's to say? Who's really to say? They released 20 tickets last week. Maybe next week they'll release more. But <laughs> you can grab some for that. And then Toronto. And that is it, guys. Until Wait, hold on a sec, Rena. What, what is happening? We, <laughs> we're getting real-time <laughs> updates about Pittsburgh and the, the potential show opener. <laughs> it has been a journey. <laughs> Regardless, all these shows, um, Indiana, Annapolis, I, I keep wanting to say Indiana, Indianapolis and Detroit are locked in. The show opener are, oh, Woo! my God, we're so, so excited. Oh, my gosh. Like, you know, if you live close by, again, like, we're not going to really tour this summer much. So, I um, mean, we will not be back to that part of the country for a little bit of time. So come to the shows. We're doing something really wild that we <laughs> tested out in, in uh, Kansas City that was fun. So the shows are getting wilder. They get wilder by the show. We're never done. We're never like, this is great. We should stop. We're always like, what can we do better? It's like fast. And it's never finished. Yeah. So every show is crazier. Yes, we tried out something very wild in Kansas City. If you guys were there, um, we had some very special guests at the show. Um, and we're going to do it again in these new cities. So come. And then Pittsburgh, my whole family will be there. So you can yes. watch me get stripped on in front of my dad. It'll be really fun for everybody. And then Toronto, and that's it. We're done for the, the summer, except for like one or two shows maybe. And then, of course, Ashley has shows um, in June and August. Um, you can go see her. Yeah, they're almost all sold out. Few you. tickets left for the late show in Philly. Everything else is sold out. Thank you. I love you guys for coming to support me solo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, Raina, hold on a second because we plugged the Crossroads Hotel in Kansas City. I want to talk about the moonrise. <laughs> So I don't. We stayed. Yeah, you, the dog floor. Well, Raina, listen, Raina stayed on the dog floor. It's a whole thing. I didn't. So I, I had a great experience. We stayed at this. It's right next to the pageant in St. Louis. And the funniest thing is that it's called the Moonrise Hotel. The entire hotel is moon themed. I have never seen anywhere. Re restaurant, hotel, bar, commit to a theme that hard. So the three of us were laying in bed after we got back to the hotel, not together, in our own separate rooms, and sending each other photos of moon-themed art. But you guys, like, hadn't seen it yet. So I was like, we're walking back to the hotel. I'm like, did you guys notice the all-moon everything? And you were like, what? I was like, 
Oh my God. Every, there was art. There's moons everywhere. There's glass cases with like when we set foot on the moon. Like it's just crazy. There was, it was just the, so hilarious to me, Man. the level of commitment to moon. <laughs> So anyway, you guys should check out the Moonrise Hotel, but do not stay on the fourth floor if you don't have a dog. And just listen, it's not only love dogs. It's, I don't love when all the dog owners are out on the town and the dogs are communicating through howling, <laughs> at, howling at each other. I mean, that's, it is, that's a crazy thing to put them all on one floor. I mean, of course, I love dog friendly anything, but it, knowing what you know about dogs, they need to be spaced out throughout the hotel because, yeah, they're all going to start getting each other riled up. It was crazy. <laughs> it was really crazy. Ashley would have left. Ashley would have packed up and gone to a different floor. I am too lazy. You're more sensitive to smells and sounds than I am, than really everybody is. I will be, I was in Portland laying in bed had flown in, landed at one in the morning and switched my room yeah. after I was naked in the bed because I, it was so loud. It was on the street. I was like, are these cars in the room? We were trying to have a company all hands for our new company with everybody. Somebody brought a salad and smelled bad. <laughs> Ashley could not focus. That was it one was- of the worst smells I've ever smelled. I smelled like, it felt like I was huffing someone's feet in my face. <laughs> That salad. Every time I tried to like start a new conversation about work, I actually brought it right back to the salad. I am sensitive to, to, to smells and, and um, um, sounds. I had this experience in the elevator the other day. It's just like a funny story, but I wanted to tell you because it was very shocking how like casual this was. So I got into my building elevator the other day. I had gone to um, CVS to grab some pack uh, tape to um, pack up these boxes. I bought like clear packing tape, yeah, yeah. whatever. Um, so I'm I get it. <laughs> Have Peggy never heard of it? Um, so I get in the elevator and there's two guys in there. I don't know, they're mid-40s, two white guys. And they have hit different floors. They don't live together. So I'm in the elevator. I'm between the two of them. I'm holding my packing tape. I don't have a bag. I'm just holding the packing tape. And then the one guy on my right goes, you going to go kidnap somebody? And I was like, I'm going to be like spicy. And I was like, you know what? I am going to go kidnap somebody, thinking I'm being like really edgy. And uh-huh. he goes, you don't want that. <laughs> you want the black kind. It's hard to talk and get that off. And I was like... What? what? And then the guy on my left who doesn't know that guy goes, you don't want that. You want the silver tape with the strings in it. Wait. People can't rip it off. D- did you recognize them? Or are these just two casual murderers in the building? I've, I, I've seen both of them in the building before. Carrying bodies so they out. They live there. <laughs> and they're putting they, bodies down the trash chute. Just monotone giving me tips for how to murder were and kidnap people. Were they hot at all? No, they were not hot. They look like the kind of people that, that would, would do it. You. Yeah. L- listen, if they were kind of hot. <laughs> like, it wouldn't would it be, be kind of funny and sexy? I mean, everything is funny and sexy if you're hot. It just, it was very crazy how, like, nonchalant it was with a stranger. Because, like, I... I mean, we have this platform, so I think about every single thing that I say constantly all the time. Mm-hmm. But these guys were just like, you don't want that. You want the silver tape with the strings. I think they're right about the silver tape. I feel you like when you see somebody. someone being, yeah. Definitely. So speaking of stuff that just gets said nonchalantly, I think we need to address something from last <laughs> week. <laughs> You're amazing with the transition. I know, we're killing it. So this woman on Twitter, her at, her at is Jean Faux Gautier which was kind of funny. Okay. John, like John Paul Gautier. Yeah, so it. she tweeted, she got, she said, girls got to eat. Hi, long time follower, second time listener, which I'm like, what? She follows us on Instagram, but she she's only listened twice. Okay. Show. And I have a question for science. So like y'all talked about sharding so casually today. I was shook. How many times have y'all shard in your lives? Do y'all shard often? Do white people shit their pants often? <laughs> Which is so funny that this woman who is, is not white is thinking like white people are crazy. Because <laughs> we is did this not affliction for other races. Only white people shit their pants. No, it was just funny that she was like these white bitches. <laughs> like it, it was a little too cavalier on Do you last think week's it was? episode. Yeah, I don't. Think I, it's I, ever I know what cavalier. She, I, I know what she meant. So. I would like to come out and say that I had a minor situation during quarantine, and that is the only time that I've shit my pants life. since I was like six. And that was when I was staying outside the house. I was locked out, and it was like a traumatic experience. I think I've shared on the show. So in adulthood, ever since I was six, I have not quote unquote shit myself since one year ago, two years ago in 2020. <laughs> Can't speak for Raina. I know she's done a lot, even in our, <laughs> in our friendship. <laughs> like I, I, I know, De- I know December twenty nineteen. She did it a lot. I know, like so. She did it a lot. December twenty when you had food poisoning. Twenty eighteen. Twenty eighteen, and that was a, that was really bad. Yeah, when I had food poisoning, I shit myself. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this I can't speak for all white people, but it's it was rare for me. I did say it very casually. Like, I was like, didn't I do this? It really did, actually. When you said it, it surprised me because I did not think you were going to cop to it so fast. I, I, thought, well, I was just talking about me. I'm low-key regretting it. <laughs> and, and I've got to figure out a way to get guys that 
I would ever want to fuck to stop listening to the show. <laughs> Um, let's see. One of the guys that I've, he doesn't know how to use a podcast. Um, one of the guys I slept with most recently does listen to the podcast, yeah. but I don't care. Yeah. I mean, I think you're, you're going to like it or you don't. Yeah. Um, Everybody's sharded, right? Ever all the white people. <laughs> all right. A couple more things. I'm going to list <laughs> guys. Our guest today is such a boss. I cannot even get over it. Thinking like she is the most famous, best, hottest divorce, <laughs> divorce attorney, attorney in, America. That, in, in America. Yeah. I mean, if you think about any high profile divorces, I mean, I will intro her in a few minutes, but like, I didn't even mention that she handled the divorces for um, Ryan Reynolds, Johnny Depp, Jimmy Iovine, Dr. Dre, uh, Hillary Duff. I mean, she has handled everyone's and I, in a moment you will hear me intro more people. I mean, it's crazy. And the Kardashians. Yeah. Kim all and of the, Kim all and of the Yes. And, and yeah. Chris, Jeez. Chris and Caitlin. I love her so much. You guys are in for such a treat. Yeah, this is really special. Um, Raina, I have a two couple. We're all over the place. Great. I have a couple wrecks okay. that I haven't watched. So pre Rex, Dale's movie. <laughs> <laughs> what is it called? It's on Amazon. I would like to Sorry. shout out the girl that wrote on our Instagram that my laugh is terrible. Uh, you could stop listening to our show because our laugh is the best thing that I do on this show. Oh, that girl was the fucking worst. Um, anyways, Dale, I'll watch anything Dale does. Dale's movie. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, where, where is where it? Is it? Okay. It's on Netflix? No, no, no. It's on Amazon. Okay. <laughs> okay, yes. It's this Dale's movie is called Love Game Match on Prime Video. Okay. And Dale's in it. So we gotta watch that. Should we stay home tonight together? And watch well, it? I'm th- I, I was planning on watching it tonight. Um, and then Chris DiStefano special. Special Weshy on Netflix. I'm so excited to watch. I watched the first like five minutes this morning as soon as I woke yeah. up. I've been watching the clips. He, so Chris has been on our show twice. We love him so much. He self-produced the special at Gramercy Theater in New York City and was just going to put it out himself. And mm-hmm. then Netflix bought it. And <sighs> he's it. just so funny. We love him so much. So um, guys, yeah. check that out on Netflix. It's out He's now. so good. It's outrageous. Ashley and I went and Bella went, saw him in Austin. We had a night mm-hmm. off. And I... I thought I was going to pee my pants. I fell off the chair. I was laughing so hard. He's so, so good. So I, I'm obsessed with the name. Speshy Weshy. Speshy Weshy. Chrissy Specials. Love I texted him and congratulated him. And I asked him if he could do my show next week at the stand. I was like, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I okay, saw. another thing. Oh, um, no, I have another. I have a rack. It's called Severance. I am loving it. It's Adam Scott um, on Apple TV. It is okay. a like sci-fi thriller show, which is like not my thing really. If you guys were into Black Mirror, um, you'll oh like right, it. right, right, yeah. I think it's like an eight-part series. Um, really quick synopsis. Um, basically, it's sort of this like sci-fi futuristic thing where people have this chip implanted into their brain, and when you're at work, you don't know that you have like an outside life. You don't know about your kids, your wife, your family, nothing. Um. And when you are outside of the building of your work, you have no idea what you do for work. It's this company that has like created a special implant and um, society knows about this. And like, if you're on a date, like you, somebody will say to you, like, what do you do for a living? And you say like, I work for so-and-so I've had severance done. And people are like, that's oh so my gosh. So yeah. it's, it's really fascinating. And you just think a lot about like, what would my like, like what would my life be like if that was my life? And so this is real. This is happening now. This is happening is now. It, it's this a, is real. It's a documentary. Yes. Um, it's a reality this is show. real life, like that other show that I told you about. The one. Ashley. <laughs> Ashley. Oh, my God. Um, but it's great. It's on Apple TV. Check it out. I, I, I'm really enjoying it. I started Minx, which I'm enjoying. Um, I watched two episodes, and you are going to watch it, I think, right? Yeah, it's on my list. I have this whole list. Um, I don't even about, know where to start because, like, you know. Because you have other stuff to do because we're running six companies. Yeah. And still do stand up. Yeah. But um, I'm, that's on my list for sure. Uh, that's about a woman in like the 1960s that wants to start this feminist magazine and link, links up with this basically porn producer and they start a magazine. Okay. So, um, it's on HBO. It's pretty good. So, okay. One thing I want to talk to you about. We all know, I mean, well, not all we all know. LaGuardia Airport has been like under construction for decades and it's like been so shitty and they redid this terminal terminal d and it's like really nice it's like on the what's yeah on, the d is water. great the d is great and, <laughs> and i post on my instagram story like you were st- i was like look at this nice family bathroom you were like here's the family family restroom you can fuck in it listen no offense to your family we're not trying to like not let families into the bathroom because we're fucking i'm it's just a joke so reina was like there's a nice family restroom and i had posted on my instagram story like here we love terminal d it's waterfront and here's the restroom you uh-huh. can fuck in and people like slid my dms talking about fucking in a restroom this one woman 
everyone was like, I got pregnant in a, fa- a airport family restroom. Like it was a real thing that people are fucking in those restrooms. Yeah, it's a real thing. There's two bathrooms in Terminal D. There's another one like further towards before you go up the, the ramp back into the main terminal. So there's two private restrooms in there and you can fuck in them. And it's nice. They're spacious. They're huge and they're, they really keep them huge. clean. They're, they're kind of secret. Clean. You don't really see them because they're also really close to like the re- the main restroom with a bunch of stalls that you would use. I've always known about this. Yeah, you do know about it. I mean, I had a girlfriend, one of the most iconic things she's ever did. She fucked in the shower in the Delta Sky Club. Which I didn't even know was private. I knew you could do that. I don't even know if you can do it. She did it. She did it. Um, I've never, I've had sex at a lot of places and I, I don't have a lot of like boundaries, but um, I, <laughs> I have never had sex at the airport and I've never, um, I've never done like mile high club. Have you? No. I mean, some of these restrooms on the plane, I am like, I can barely fit in here. Mm-hmm. Like I'm thinking, I'm thinking of like my brother, like he couldn't physically fit. Mm-hmm. Like I barely can get in there. Like I have never even been in one. May, maybe on like a huge plane, like going to the West Coast or flying internationally, if I'm like, you know, flying Delta One or whatever, they are a little bigger. But outside of that, I've never been in. I always think about it. I always think of like, how could anyone fucking hear? I am teacup sized. I, I'm a very petite person. I couldn't have sex in one of those. And I don't want to. The smell is disgusting. No, no. I will do anything for the thrill except for that. Yeah. I have done terrible shit just to get laid. Not that. I absolutely will join the Mile High Club probably in the next few years on my own private jet. <laughs> and that will be my first time fucking in the air. Yeah. I'm going to be that. on a, I'm going to be on a PJ and that's what it is. I, and that, I wish you guys should have seen she just threw up a peace sign and that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be Samantha Jones and Richard Wright, and we're going to have some get champagne and strawberries. Eight, yes. I'm going to get my pussy ate at 30,000 feet, and that's when I'm joining the Mile High Club. I'm not going to, I'm going to be a Mile High Club virgin until it's on a private jet. I would never. I have masturbated on multiple planes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, I I like to sex a lot. And sometimes, you know, my like the last guy I dated long term was like so filthy. You, you don't see it when you look at him, but he was. And mm-hmm. he I have had to like get up from a seat and like yeah. gone to masturbate in the plane, uh, in the bathroom a bunch of times. In the, in the bathroom. See, I mean, if you have your own little like, if you're in Delta One, if you have your, uh, what do we call it? Pod. Your pod, your pod. Like, I don't know. I, I can hold in like an orgasm. I can go more like silent with it. I don't need to be like, huh. like, I don't need to make noise. I could have a what is your What is your workout sound? <laughs> I'm not going to really do it. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> but I could have a silent uh, orgasm on a plane. Yeah, but I can't get my fingers deep enough into oh, my Oh, I would be pussy. using a vibrator. You're going to bust out a vibrator on a plane? <laughs> no, you won't. You're going to shove a vibrator in your pants in a plane. Maybe and I, then you're going to come. Oh, maybe, maybe not. Maybe you're right. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm lying to myself. <laughs> maybe I'm lying I think you're right. Myself. I think you're right. I, I don't think I would. I think maybe you're right. Maybe I'm lying to myself. How often, how many times have you done this? Zero. Wait, all I'm saying is, let's just, <laughs> let's think about it. Like, a, if you are on a really long flight, really yeah. long flight, you have your own pod, everyone's <laughs> sleeping, and you're sexting with somebody, and you have a little bullet with you, it could happen. You're going to turn on a vibrator <laughs> on a plane. <laughs> You're gonna bust out a vibrator tell you in that? first class I, where they are ten feet up your ass every five every five seconds. Do you need a water? Do you need a drink? Here's a snack. Here's this entire box of snacks. You're gonna bust out a vibrator. I guess not. I guess you're right. But can I tell you that because I don't masturbate manually or acoustic, I when, when you said you you masturbated on a plane ten minutes ago, I pictured you with the vibrator. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Maybe I'm lying. I'm lying to myself. You're lying to yourself. Well, you can't. Right, maybe I'm not the bad bitch I thought. <laughs> you don't, that's so crazy. That would be like illegal and crazy. Why? You'd be a real sex, you'd be a real sex Ill- offender. Illegal. You would be a sex offender Are you to bring serious? up to be f- masturbating with a vibrator on a plane <laughs> in public. <laughs> that is the kind of shit people go to jail for. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> yes, it is. Are you serious? <laughs> I guess yeah, you're- you could go to jail. All right. You will be out with, with the air marshals at the gate. Oh, if you're God. just using your hand and they walk over and they're like, ma'am, you can't be doing that. And I would be like, prove it. Doing what? But you have a vibrator in your hand. Okay. I never thought of it like that. 
<laughs> that anyway. being said, I masturbated on a Greyhound bus once, oh, and ugh. I feel fine about it. Yeah, with my hand. That's disgusting. But you're gonna masturbate with a with a. I guess I never thought about it <laughs> like that. I guess um, I won't be doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm gonna have to wait for the private jet for that too. You can just go into the bathroom. Well, I masturbate manually, so yeah. I mean, if I ever find myself in an airplane restroom with a vibrator, I'm going to reevaluate my life choices. <laughs> <laughs> like, how are you going to get, you won't take your phone into the bathroom, but you'll bring your vibrator. <laughs> I have never done you're it. You're walking down the aisle with a vibrator that's in your I, hand. That's you're what like, I'm girls got to eat, you that, know? That's you what I'm saying. Like, if you find yourself in a teeny tiny airplane bathroom with your vibrator, you look in the mirror. Are you like, what am I doing with my life? Or are you like, I'm a bad bitch? I just, I feel like I would just be like, I got to get done. It is what it is. You know, it is what it is. Yeah. I I don't feel any sort of way about it. I've gone to the bathroom to masturbate. So like, whatever. Yeah. I'm like sliding off the seat. Sometimes I'm just like, I'm in the middle of a good sex session. Oh my gosh. Okay. (sighs) Time for our guest. All right, guys. We have a very cool, very special guest today. She is an attorney specializing in divorce and was named one of the Hollywood Reporter's 100 Power Lawyers. She is well known for her celebrity clients representing the likes of Angelina Jolie, Heidi Klum, Kim Kardashian, Christina Aguilera. It was very hard for me to edit down this list because there's so many. Um, She is the chief of divorce evolution at divorce.com and the author of It Doesn't Have to Be That Way, How to Divorce Without Destroying Your Family or Bankrupting Yourself. Please welcome to the show, Laura Wasser. Hi, ladies. Hi. Hi. We're so glad to have you. <laughs> I'm just, glad to be here. Thank I don't you know, for including me. Yeah, I don't know two single women who are more passionate about talking about pre- prenups <laughs> and divorce. So we're really excited to get into this with you today. Cool. Uh, you are coming to us from LA from your beautiful home. I am like, obs- I'm like such a whore for decor. I'm, <laughs> I'm obsessed with your decorations. Yeah, I'm like trying to peek around. It looks amazing. Thank you. Uh, no, it's a, it, was, it wasn't bad being here for two years during COVID. We're actually back in the office mostly now, but I got really used to doing podcast here so i figured it'd be better and it's prettier so yeah it is it's it's gorgeous well you have an incredible career um you were recommended as a guest to us we actually put on our story uh who would you guys like to see on the show and and a few people asked for you so um and we have wanted to do an episode about divorce and prenups for a long time so you are just the absolute perfect person oh good look there's nothing i like talking about more than this i've been (laughs) doing it for, you know, almost 30 years now, 27 or 28. So Mm -hmm. it's one subject that I actually know a little bit about. And I (laughs) really like speaking to young people, particularly young women, because there's so much that we don't think about when we get into relationships, when we get married. And then unfortunately, when those marriages kind of are on the brink of ending and ending. So it's really good, I think, to know beforehand, because it's one of those things that nobody ever talks to you about. You know, your mom might sit you down and say, here's what's going to happen on your wedding night. But she doesn't ever sit you down and say, well, here's what's going to happen when you get that prenup, or here's what's going to happen when you get divorced. So I guess I'm that person that's going to tell you that. (laughs) A hundred percent. I mean, and the stat of half of marriages and a divorce is thrown around. Is that accurate? It's accurate and it does vacillate. And it usually takes a couple of years to get the prior year's stats. Mm -hmm. So we don't know exactly what COVID has done in terms of Mm -hmm. divorce. Also, there's been so many holdups in terms of the court system. It's hard to say. So I don't know if the divorce rate went up or down during COVID. Everyone said it was going to go up. I actually think that some people might have had the opportunity to be like stuck Mm -hmm. together for certain periods of time and figure out different, um, you know, sharing of roles in the household because you were all there and that, and also different ways and tools of communicating. And I think some people kind of emerged from COVID with healthier, stronger relationships. But like I said, it's just really hard to tell statistically. One thing to know is when you hear the statistic that, you know, 50% of marriages end in divorce, that doesn't mean 50% of the people getting married are getting divorced because you have to imagine there's plenty of people out there that are getting married and divorced multiple times. Mm -hmm. So when you think 50% of marriages, you've got some guy that's like getting married every few years he's taking up a big part of that average right, right. <laughs> like my dad yeah my dad's got three divorces under his belt yeah, like there you go. <laughs> my, my aunt kathy well l- tell us a little bit about your background i mean uh in terms of we can go back to you you, you went through a divorce but just what made you passionate about this type of law oh, it's hard to get passionate about this type of law i i actually i grew up here my dad was and is a, a family law attorney and i got married when i was in my second year of law school. 
And then okay. after I finished law school, my third year of law school and took the bar, we split up. So it was about 14 months. And so we didn't have anything. We had some credit card debt. We had a lease on a house that we had in the Hollywood Hills. We had a dog. And I went to my dad. I wasn't working at his firm, but I was like, listen, I need some money. I was working for like a nonprofit organization, making sure that all of the restaurants in um, Hollywood had rails so that people, disabled people could get in. It was okay. very exciting. <laughs> and I, but, I, but I didn't make any money. So I went to my dad and I said, can I work here for this summer? And he said, yes. And I said, so Alvaro and I are splitting up and he's like, okay, well, you know how to do it. So I worked there. I did my own divorce. And I realized even for someone that English was my first language, I went to law school and the forms and just the process were completely stunning. Like I didn't get it. And again, I was a lawyer, like imagine going through it being like, frustrated, heartbroken, scared, not knowing any of the legal lingo, lingo and having to go through it. So that kind of informed how I started representing clients. And obviously mm -hmm. when I started working at the firm, I didn't have like, you know, big famous rich clients. I had some of the younger clients and some of the ones that we maybe did pro bono. And it always stuck with me. Like we have people out there that cannot afford expensive divorce lawyers and probably don't need them, frankly, even if they can afford them, there has to be a simpler way, which is why I wrote the book in 2013 and then started a company in 2018, which was then absorbed by divorce.com who are really trying to make it simpler for people to go through the, the legal process, simpler and less expensive and less aggravating. Because again, especially if you have kids, you're probably going to know the person that you're divorcing for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. uh, you shouldn't burn a bridge with them. It's not a normal lawsuit. Like if you hit somebody on the freeway or you're getting into a you know dispute with your landlord, this person you're going to know. So we have to get you through it in a way that doesn't completely blow your bank accounts and so that you can continue working together and raising kids or having your, you know, co-owned stuff. For sure. I mean, I, I imagine there's a vast difference between, well, you tell me, divorces with and without kids. Um, it's not that vast. Really, the kid, the custody and child support part of it is a very different part. And one thing that I have seen over my career is that people are much better now about figuring out custody. You know, it used to be that mom would get the kids and maybe dad would have every other weekend and a Wednesday night. We're much more dad oriented now. We're much more equal now. And I feel like people, by the time they get to divorce, are much better about keeping the kids out of it, making sure the kids mm -hmm. know that they're loved and figuring out a way to work together and share custody better than it was when my parents' generation was splitting up. I, I'm certainly the ones before them. We're more used to it and we get it more and kids get it more. That's so interesting. I never thought about that because my, my, my mom is a psychologist and when my parents got divorced when I was four, my parents put my brother and I in therapy and it was very important that like we knew that my parents loved us. This was nothing to do with us and my parents went to therapy with us about this, but I don't think that is super common and I don't know a lot of people that had that experience 30 years ago. Right. Right. And now it is much more common. Um, maybe not as much putting the kids in therapy, but having either family therapy altogether, or certainly like in Los Angeles, we are just rife with like co-parenting therapists, family counselors, people mm -hmm. that will help you get through it probably better and more equipped than a divorce lawyer who we're supposed to know the law. We apply the law to the facts. We figure out the financial situation, but we're not qualified. And it always kind of irks me when family law attorneys like kind of insert themselves into it to know what's going on in the head of a minor mm -hmm. child or how to best, you know, speak to them or whatever. There are other people that are really good at that. And, you know, in LA, we're great at finding an expert for a professional for everything. So people come to me already with that kind of either worked out or in the process. And I actually think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's talk about prenups from the beginning. Like, why do you need one? You know, we don't need to all the ins and outs and technical things about them, but I, you know, misconceptions, like what they exactly do in terms of coming into a marriage and leaving it. Like, let's just talk about it. For, so our audience knows, I mean, we're fans, okay. we're huge <laughs> fans of prenups. <laughs> so, okay. High level is this. All right. And again, it's going to depend on what state you're in and maybe you don't need a prenup, but, but what I find so fascinating and look, I did this too, even though I was a law student when I got married, you get married and you, you sign contracts, you get a contract for the venue where you're going to have your wedding. And you probably have some kind of a contract or invoice for the person who's making your dress and your caterer and the band and the string quartet and the florist and everyone else you've got all these contracts and there's clauses in there about what happens if it rains or what, you know, all this stuff. But the most important contract that you enter into when you're getting married is your marriage contract. And everyone goes, oh, it's so unromantic and it's not sexy. 
dude, you're doing it anyway. When you get married, you're signing a contract. Whether you have a prenup or not, the contract is the law in the state that you are going to live in and be married in is going to govern you. So if you split up and you as the woman are making more money for whatever reason, you're going to pay him spousal support. And if you split up half of the money, if you live in a community property state like California, it's going to be his. And you need to know that. So again, it's not unromantic or sexy to go, okay, let me just check this out. What's the law where I live and what's the contract that I'm entering into? And then next is, does that work for me? Now, again, it does, wouldn't work for me. I mean, I don't like the fact that if I'm working, I'm going to have to pay half of my retirement benefits and my money. And what if I'm a screenwriter and I write a screenplay? If I write it during my marriage, half of that's going to go to him oh if we God. split up. Half of that screenplay he's going to own. Or I paint a painting or buy a house, you know, all of that stuff. I'm not sure I'm down for that. I also don't know if he, you know, he and I both went to business school, let's say, and we were both stars, but yet for some reason we get out of business school and he's like lying on the couch every day and I'm going to work and I'm paying the rent. I don't want to pay him support. And what's good for the goose is good for the gander, ladies. It's going to be the same whether you're making the money or he's making the money. It doesn't matter who the wife or who the husband is. If you're making more money, you're paying support. So... If you don't like that, then you can say, I'd like to opt out of certain parts of the contract that the state wants me to sign and make my own rules. And here's what they are. I'm going to keep all the money that I make during the marriage in one account, and you're going to keep all the money that you make during the marriage in one account, and we're going to contribute to a joint account to pay our living mm -hmm. expenses, but nobody's going to accrue extra. Or if I started a company before we got married, my company is going to stay my separate property and whatever you can do is your separate property, but we'll both contribute. This isn't like we're, mm -hmm. you know, but we're not going to be bound by the laws of the state in which we live. So the two really important things are one, find out what the laws are where you live and two, find out if that's something you want or if you want to opt out of it. And then you have a conversation. And so many people call me and go, how am I supposed to have that conversation? Isn't that pre-negotiating a divorce? Isn't that jinxing my marriage? But as I said, you're already entering into a contract. Do you think it's super romantic that we get married and we adhere to the laws of the state that we're getting married? And nobody cares about that. It's just so much of it is unsexy. It's just, it's what it is. Like, it's not the movies. Like, uh -huh. yes. Anyway, keep I, well, I just, I want to say like, you know, I think that everybody is well-intentioned until they're not. And everybody loves you until they don't. And if you look at any breakup, they're really messy and people get really angry and people do things that you never expected them to do to you in a million years. <laughs> before you even bring money into it and children and property. People do terrible things to each other. And I think it's unrealistic to not assume that could happen. And I don't think that it is saying that something bad is going to happen in our marriage if I protect myself. I think it's saying that this is a business proposal. And if anybody came to me with a business and said that it even had a 50% chance of failing, if somebody said to me it had a 15% chance of failing, I would want some contracts in place that protected myself from that failure. And right. it's nothing more than that. And it's not because I don't love you or I don't trust you. It's just things happen. Let's just be realistic about it. Yeah. Well, and even more than that, if somebody came to you with a business that said, this is a hundred percent guaranteed, wouldn't you still want to know what the terms were? Right. Even right. if it was going to succeed. So again, you want to go in. And I also think it's really important. And I, this maybe is part of the sexiness that we can restore to the idea of prenups. Having communications, before you get married to somebody finding out because one of the one of the things in most states that's really important is full disclosure i have to disclose what i have i have to disclose my debt you imagine getting married to somebody he's like oh right. by the way i have a really big student loan that i'm going to be paying off with money i'm making during our marriage oh and i also have an ex-wife that i'm paying you have to disclose that before you get married so that's one thing that's important and talking about it and then also talking about what the expectations are like you know big time expectations i'm going to want to retire when i'm this age so I'm going to want to put this much away every year, or I want to make sure that we only have two credit cards and we're not maxing out a bunch. You have better chances of making your marriage work and stay together. If you have those open lines of communication and you both know what to expect going in, can the expectations change? Yes. You can say like, I'm so into my job. I love it so much. I'm such a career woman. I'm always going to work. And then you have a kid and you're like, Oh my God, I can never go back to work. I want to be home with the kid. Things can change and evolve, but you have to be able to talk about them with your partner so that you can figure out the best way of dealing with how those changes are. And if you don't have the changes, if the conversations at the outset, then you're never going to be have to, able to have them later on as you're talking. And if you don't think it's sexy, this is one thing to say to your young women listeners. Guess what happens when you're giving birth and you're lying on the table? You poop. 
He's going to be there. He's going to see you poop. <laughs> that is not sexy. <laughs> Have this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> then that thing will be less sexy. And maybe because of that reality and that rawness and being able to like open yourself up so vulnerably, you'll actually stay together for longer. Absolutely. I think the common misconception, at least for, I mean, even for me was that like, you have to have a ton of money to need a prenup. And I think you've reframed it for me, at least to just say like, okay, if we walk away from this, this is just like percentages, you yeah. know, it's, it's not that I need to be a millionaire and you need to make $50,000 a year. We need to figure that out. It's just sort of like, also, wouldn't you rather negotiate with me now when I'm happy and everything's And good? I love you. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Before you cheat on me. <laughs> yeah. But and like, I mean, the other thing is this, you may have these conversations and realize that you really don't need a prenup up that what you want both starting this relationship is you both have nothing or you both have a certain amount and that's going to stay separate because that does stay separate that's the law what you come in with kind of stays separate but we're going to get married and we really want to be partners and put everything into this together and if that's good for you then you're fine with it. And maybe you don't want a prenuptial agreement, but I just think it's important to know. Spousal support's another thing people talk about. What if we don't make any money right now, but I start making a ton of money through my work efforts? Do you really want to have to be paying a ton of spousal support? Let's set a cap on the spousal support so that I never have to pay you more than a certain amount. Child support and child custody don't go in prenups. Right, so that's sure. going to be whatever it's going to be. You can't negotiate those things at the time of marriage. You have to negotiate them if and when you split up. Yeah. So those don't come into it. But I'll, oh, and the other thing that you should know, because people always ask is, you can't really put something in there. People do. And if people want to adhere to them, it's fine. But they're not really enforceable. These things like, if you cheat on me, then I get this. <laughs> or here's one I heard. If you don't lose the baby weight then I don't have to pay you this. Oh yeah. I was like, I can't go in there and say that to her. You're a horrible person. <laughs> She's not going to want to marry you. But those are the kind of things that aren't enforceable because they define somebody's behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Not People putting the toilet seat down too. I didn't write that prenup. So and they I came support it. Like no, I'm <laughs> um, can you, I have, I've heard the cheating thing said, but I, I, it doesn't, I like, I, is that not enforceable? If it can you put in a thing that says if I catch you having an affair, you owe me twenty million dollars? Yeah, you can put that in there. And if he or she is willing to abide by it, okay. But otherwise, it's not enforceable. So I don't put things in my prenups that aren't enforceable. But people have come to me with other prenups, and I'm like, well, there's a clause in here about cheat adultery, whatever. And they're like, yeah, I want to enforce it. And either the person who cheated is willing to or not. Um, you just kind of have to see. I like to make sure that our prenups at our firm are fully enforceable. So we really try to stick to the letter of the law. Um, so I have a couple questions. So without a prenup, you do retain everything you came into before the wedding day. So it's just what's made after the wedding day. Right. In most states, again, California's community property. So it's pretty clear delineation of what separate property came in before and, and not. But people, what they do, particularly in other states that are equitable distribution states, which is the majority, I think there's only nine community property states. But in other states, sometimes people commingle the assets. So let's say I inherit mm -hmm. something from my family and I use that plus money that my husband made to put a down payment on a house. So then that house would be, you know, owned jointly. Mm -hmm. You have to go back and kind sure. of carve out what my inheritance was. And again, having a prenup really sets things out clearly. So, okay, mm -hmm. we're buying a house. I'm going to put this much that I inherited in. You're going to put this much. This is what will happen if we split up. And it makes it simpler. And you don't have to then be going back 13 years tracing, okay, what did I put in? How did this work? You have it all at your fingertips to, to look at. And it's not to prove anything or to bust anybody. It's just kind of to be like, we have very clear expectations and an understanding understanding of what we each came in with. I love it that we started this conversation talking about when women make money and they, they make more money. I mean, that would be more the situation we would be in. But like a lot of times you see the other side of it of a, like, let's just say for the sake of the example, a woman that is marrying a man that makes more and the plan is that she would have kids and, and not work. And do you see a lot of women being like, well, I don't want to do the prenup because I want to be paid for my supporting this partner while he's making money. Like I, I'm going to deserve some of that. And yes. then, yeah. And again, like, and she would say like, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to pursue my career. I'm going to be performing the duties of this relationship from home, whether that's actually, you know, making my own baby food and feeding the kids or figuring out which nanny to hire and which chef to hire that's going to blend up the baby food. I mean, it goes all socioeconomic ranges. But again, one time, one thing that people in that situation will say is, 
I want a share of what you're making. It may not all be mm -hmm. community property, but I want some of it to go towards the community so yeah. that I know that I'm not completely left out in the cold. The other right. thing, and particularly in states where there's heavy statutory law about what prenups will be enforceable, California is one of them, New York's one of them. If you enter into a contract that's, that's unconscionable, that's so one-sided, sometimes that will be a reason for it not to be enforceable. So for example, I'm 20, I just got out of cosmetology school, I may be making like $25,000 a year scraping things together, and I meet my bajillionaire boyfriend who's got a ton of money and is always flying me everywhere private, and we stay in five-star hotels, and we go on his yacht, we get married she would probably not sign a prenup that gives her absolutely nothing if and when they split up. She would say, you know, I want a gift of a certain amount each year that we're together. I'm going to get support for a certain period of time with a cap when we break up. That way, if and when they split up five years down the line, a court won't go, well, this is completely unconscionable. She's not going to go from five years flying private and staying in five-star hotels to living in a refrigerator box under a bridge. We have to give her something. And so we don't want this prenup to be, you know, declared invalid we're going to give her something. So we always like throw a bone to that person to make sure that he or she isn't just giving up the farm. But with, but in that example, this like broke woman and this rich guy. Let's pretend it's somebody that I'm dating yeah. <laughs> and they get to live high on the horse because of me. Um, but <laughs> either way, someone that doesn't have money and someone that does, I mean, if you just get married without any prenup, don't you get half of what they made automatically? Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. But yes. that's yes. just Cal. So I, to, tag on to that every are there crazy different laws in 50 states or are there just like three different kinds of laws like it's not 50 percent in all states no it's only 50 percent in the community property states and there's only nine states however new york for example is an equitable distribution state so that's the other theory of law you're still going to be entitled to a good portion of what your breadwinner spouse made during the marriage. He might say it, it shouldn't be a full easy half. It should be this. And those are the only two ways of looking at it. But there those are, are the only states, two things. Yes. But there are other states, I mean, depending on where you live, Texas, for example, is particularly breadwinner, which usually is man friendly. They're going to be like, oh no, you're not getting half of that. You're not even getting a quarter of that. But again, it depends on the judges. It's just a certain way of looking at how yeah. assets were made and held during the marriage. They also have lower support schemes. California has got one of the highest spousal support. So the, what we come up with is very similar to the marital lifestyle. So to answer your question, getting married without one, everything as it would be. If you say, I want one and neither one of you have much, but one of you really believes that he or she is going to be super successful. And the deal is that the other person stays home and takes care of the kids. Person staying home and taking care of the kids is saying, I am not okay with you just keeping everything you make. You want me to not work take care of our children, take care of our household. And that, look, that's not something to poo poo. I mean, that may be decorating a 25,000 square foot mansion or something. There's, there is work to be put in there. I'm not saying, so he or she would say, I'd like 50% of what you make to go into the community. I want to make sure. And if look, sometimes if you can't get on the same page about what the expectations are, you don't get married because again, if you guys came to the table with a guy, neither one of you had a ton of money, but you had good careers and you both felt very good about your careers. And he said, well, if you have kids, you're on your own. You'd be like, well, guess what? You're on your own now. I don't want to marry you because that doesn't sound like a good plan to me. I don't mm -hmm. want to have to be competing with you for who's bringing home dollars. If we've got kids at home. A hundred percent. And just so people have an idea, this can sound maybe a little overwhelming. Like, what are we talking, how long it takes to draft one of these up? Is, is it fairly simple because the terms are kind of like, check the box, what you want, what you don't want? Or does this, is this like weeks, months? Like, what is the, I, I worry say, sometimes people just don't want to do the, the extra work, but is it right. that much extra work? It's some extra work. I mean, the disclosure portion of it's a lot. And again, if you don't have much, then it's not going to be a lot to disclose. But right. if you have a lot of assets or complicated trust or, you know, limited liability corporations, then that can be. But usually with my clients, somebody's got a business manager, somebody's able to compile that for us. Mm -hmm. And then it really is four or five things that you're talking about. One is how you're going to hold the things that are made or purchased during the marriage. One's going to be the support component, what you're going to live on. There's some death provisions that you put in there because a prenuptial agreement can't be changed unless both people agree. A will, you can change. So you see mm -hmm. these 
old guys that at the last minute leave all their money to their caretaker and the wife, the wife's like, what happened? <laughs> you can't do that if you put something in the prenup that says your young, beautiful wife is going to at least be able to live in the house until whatever time she gets this much of the estate. You can't change that. You can change everything else in your will, but this is going to pre-exist mm, that. So okay. that's another thing people put in there, especially if there's a big age difference or mm. one person does kind of death defying sports as like a helicopter pilot or, you know, yeah. does something dangerous. Th those are things to t keep in mind. So, yeah. And then it's like the negotiations and that can be tough because both people mm -hmm. have lawyers. And it's very interesting to me because most of the time family law attorneys are drafting and negotiating prenup. We're used to being aggressive and assertive and arguing and advocating for our clients. But when you are doing a prenup, you have to remember these people love each other. They're mm -hmm. not breaking up. They're getting mm -hmm. together. So you yeah. have to approach it a little differently. You're not going to be like, I'm going to fucking kill, you know, no, you're going to know this is nice. And after we're done signing this, you're going to go to your cake tasting together. So let's make sure right. that we have a lovely experience here. And, you know, some of my colleagues are not great about that. And there are some of us that are like, we don't do prenups. That's just not my thing. I don't, you know, but I do. I like them. They make me happy. And again, I will say for the most part, the prenups I've done over the past 20 some odd years, I have not seen the people again. What, for whatever reason, there have been a few that have come back and their divorces have been much simpler, at least the, the negotiating of the financial and the legal stuff than otherwise. They're still are heartbroken and sad and scared, but at least they know what to expect. And it's so much less expensive and so much less aggravating. Oh my God. Yeah. It's like, can't even imagine. I mean, I just, I believe it. Like the, the couples that are going to do that and be reasonable and realistic about life and the way things play out. And like, let's make sure we're on the same page about all this stuff. I mean, it's not the same, but like Ray and I would never think we're going to break up. We're going to do this forever. We still have stuff to protect us. And if we do, right. you know, and we're not fucking, you know, we're, we have less to fight about and than a romantic <laughs> relationship. So oh, we have business still, managers that yeah. have protected us from each other. And we can like yes. sit, sit in a room and be like the best of friends and be like, okay, Okay, but what if we don't? What if we break right. up? And like, what does this look like? So I know it's different, and um, For you know, sure. and, and it's not it's, that different. That's right. the thing. It it's just really people want it to be. Different. They want yes. it to be romantic. They think it's unromantic. It's like there's so many things. The the best relationships have the unsexiest stuff where you sit yes. down. You have your like quarterly check ins. How's it going? You divide your household chores up. None of this is sexy. But that's another thing to talk about, which is the fact that as women, we so often abdicate some of that financial stuff because it's not fun and it's not sexy. I always say to women, and now that you're married, you really should get in there quarterly and have those conversations with the business manager, even though he's making mm -hmm. the money, it's your money. And I've seen so many marriages, particularly in Hollywood, break up and one party or the other, often the woman be like, I had no idea. I mean, I had no idea <laughs> that Teresa we were in Judas, debt. Teresa Judice went to jail because of what her <laughs> husband was signing her name to. Yeah. I know that they were trying to like make an example of her, but like that is a very real thing that can happen. Like that you are you are on the hook for this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I always say like, Ashley like jokes about going to jail. And I was like, you go to jail, I'm going to jail. What are you doing that I don't know about? <laughs> we are going to go to jail together. Um, I have a question um, before we like move on from prenups. Um, what? We're not this whole episode. Yeah, I don't to, I'm actually really enjoying this. Um, can you talk to us about post nups and like, do those exist? And can you ask for that? Yeah, you can ask for it. They're more, they're more difficult because it's already, there's less leverage. It's not like, well, if right. this doesn't work out, we're not getting married. You're not supposed to say during the negotiation of a postnup, if this doesn't work out, then we're getting divorced. You're not supposed to do a postnup to, you know, leverage against divorce. You, I see people a lot of times after somebody's maybe had an affair and they come to me and they're like, oh. okay, we're doing this postnup because he cheated on me and I want to change the terms of our relationship or, or of our prenup maybe. And I want to fix it up. And Wait, I said, hold okay, on but, really quick. A post-nup is like midway through the marriage. You want to do a right, prenup basically. Right. Okay. Got exactly. It, it shouldn't be called a post-nup. It should be called a during nup. During because nup. A post, because a post-nup is a divorce. Sounds, okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's after the nuptials. Okay, right. Post-nup. So prenup is prenuptials, meaning yeah. the wedding ceremony. Post-nup is during the marriage. And again, there's all kinds of reasons for them. Usually maybe if somebody's financial circumstances have changed so much, you know, my, my parents passed away and they left me all this money or one of my trusts started distributing assets. And now we're living at a certain level. And I want to make sure that that's dealt with. Sometimes people just rush so quickly to get married that they're like, Oh shit, I forgot to do a prenup. <laughs> Sounds like a licked and I left my baby on the bus. 
<laughs> but um, but so then they'll come to us and we'll put something together within like a few months of the marriage. That's easier. But once you're in, there's a little bit different difficult to negotiate, but it's doable. You have to have the same kind of disclosure. Everything has to be disclosed. This is what I have, this is what I spend, this is what we do, and then uh-huh. you kind of get into it. But they're they are enforceable and people do them. It's just not as common. Okay. Well, I ask because I have a girlfriend who ended up getting divorced, but she got married and she found out very early on, I'm talking like two months into the marriage that her spouse had incredible amounts of debt and he had not disclosed that to her and it was credit card debt and student loan debt. And this, she was making more money than him at this point. So she was really on the hook for this. And I think she was just like paralyzed with terror for what Mm -hmm. this would do to her. Um, And so they ended up splitting up, but I didn't know in that case, if somebody could then request a post up and say like, I'm not responsible for this. Yes. She probably wouldn't have been responsible for his debt anyway, but Mm -hmm. if I were her, I would have wanted to hear him say it and sign off on it so that every month he wasn't like, can we please, you know, like, and she'd be going out to dinner with you girls. And he'd be like, I have to work another shift at Subway to pay for my student debt. (laughs) Again, why it's important to have these conversations beforehand can you imagine what a betrayal that felt like when she found out after they got married that he had all this debt no and yeah. i just i wouldn't be afraid i was be on the hook for the debt he accrued before the marriage i'd be afraid of what you're gonna do to me now that we're married like yeah. what kind of decisions are you gonna make now right. I, I mean you, you hear that a lot like i heard of this couple that broke up recently they were engaged and she just hadn't been honest about like basically her parents paying for her life like her rent you know things like that she she hadn't told him and I mean I don't know if he was you know some some people sometimes people are just they want to be naive they just don't want to know but then he found out and he was like wait so what happens on the wedding day I then pay what the parents have been paying you know and so they they broke off the engagement and I don't I don't know if they're figuring it out but I was like I get it like a hundred percent like that's not fair Totally true. So yeah, I mean, and again, if you're having those kind of conversations before you get married, you're less likely to get into a, even without lawyers, less likely to get into that kind of a situation. People don't talk. I mean, when I got married, he was Roman Catholic. I'm Jewish. We never even talked about like what religion we'd raise our kids, which was a sign to me later looking back that we probably were too young to get married. But conversations about like, hey, I was thinking that, you know, my parents are elderly and I probably don't want to put them in assisted living. We have a back house. Are you okay if they come live with Mm -hmm. us? These are things that should be discussed before you get married. Because if somebody's like, oh, no, I hate old people the way they smell, the way they look, (laughs) or or, I just hate your parents, Mm -hmm. you need to have those discussions before. Now, people aren't always going to be completely candid, but at least you can say, we talked about this. They're moving in. Yeah. I think people sometimes are so desperate to get married. They want the ring. They want it. They want the title. They want all the things. They are purposely don't bring that stuff up. I'm not everybody. Right. And I think some people are just fucking stupid, but I think sometimes <laughs> it's just like, I don't want to know the answer. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, right. Which is, that's do you think that's changing though? Do you think it's changing between like your guys' generation and maybe my generation? I'm in my early fifties. Like, do you think it's a little bit different now that particularly women are like, I don't need the ring and the wedding so badly. Yeah. I need to be smart about what, how I'm casting my lot for the next however many years or who I'm having children with. Yeah, for sure. I, I yeah. think that we're seeing more examples of women having children and not be married mm-hmm. um, and women making, making more, more than men. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Just yeah. people waiting in general. Women are more educated than they used to be. We've done lots of interviews with people that have talked about how, you know, the, the marriage the age is like that yeah. disparity. Um, I don't know how often you are talking to people about their finances before they get married because you're a divorce attorney, but um, do you ever give people advice or if like I was your daughter and I was getting married, would you say like combine your fan- finances, don't combine them, have like a central bank account for the two of you and then have separate accounts. Do you have like advice? About yes. That? 100%. I would, first of all, and here's the other interesting thing. Women will come to me and like, you know, I, these are women that when I was younger, they were like the, the doyens of like Hollywood where they could get a table at any restaurant and they had a personal shopper at Barney's and Neiman's and Saks. And like, they just were like the most stellar, amazingly styled women. And some of them came to me later, you know, and, and said, I'm so embarrassed. I, I know I could get a table at any restaurant and I have a personal shopper and I wear only couture, but I don't have any idea what my husband makes, what it costs us to live. I know nothing. I don't even have my own credit card. So yes, what I would say to young women, and it's not just clients, but it's my, I have boys, but my, my friends, kids and young women that I speak with when I go to speak at law schools and business schools always have your own credit card. You should have your own credit. I always tell parents, like get your kids their own credit cards. Like even if it's one of the green American express with a low limit so that you know how to do it. You know, kids these days, because we have Venmo and everything else don't necessarily know how to like 
balance a checkbook, which is okay. I was never good about that, but have an, a bank account so that you know what's going in and what's going out of whatever that is, your, your Zelle or your Venmo and have a credit card so that you're building up credit so that when and if you want to buy something of your own, you have it. And then if, you know, not everybody has a business manager, if you're wealthy enough to have a business manager, if you and your spouse have a business manager, you get in there to those meetings. But I think young women and men should know a little bit about the stock market, even if you're just doing penny stocks and playing with it. Don't abdicate financial responsibility, both when you're on your own and as you are getting into a relationship. It's so important and it really will give you a sense of power, even if you're not working or or being the person that's bringing home the bacon, know about it because it also makes you more of a partner. I have a lot of clients who they were not the working spouses, but they were the spouse that did all the finances. They paid all the bills. They know exactly what it costs for their mortgage and their utilities. The husband doesn't know anything. He's making the money. It's coming home. The wife's doing it all. And I tell you, she's not the wife that's like coming home, sneaking like shopping bags into the closet because she doesn't have to, because she knows exactly what they have and what they can afford and what kind of a party or a bar mitzvah or a quinceanera or a sweet 16 they're having because she's planning it. And those women really approach the relationship with so much more confidence. And I do believe that their spouses have more respect for them because of it. A hundred percent. Also, I mean, I don't know the wealthier partner wants to be in a relationship like that. Or the no, other person you doesn't don't, know. Because you don't really have a partner. You just have mm-hmm. somebody. And and again, I've had a lot of these relationships, especially in Hollywood where things have tanked or somebody's gotten canceled. And she's like, I never knew he was having these problems. And he never came to her. I mean, mm-hmm. what is she, his baby girl? Like his like, you know, this is his wife. She mm-hmm. needs to know. He needs to be able to share this. I think they probably could have worked through the relationship if she would have actually been a part of what was going on. I just don't think it serves anybody to keep this person completely in the dark, even if you think you're being paternalistic and protecting her. Well, do you think there's an element of someone making so much that they're like, I don't, but then you shouldn't be married. Let's just put that out there. But like, you really don't want them to know because they'll be like, whoa, <laughs> I had no idea that you were making a hundred million dollars a year, you know, like, is there right. a, a level of like, I dated someone and this was a sign that it wasn't the best relationship. I just made so much more money than him. And I didn't really want him to, to know. Right. But well, I think again, dating a is of, a little different than being sure. married. Once 100%. you like share a lease or move in or certainly have kids, it's a little bit different. You don't have to at the outset flaunt like, Hey, I got this meal. Don't worry about it. I mean, right. But yes, as you are getting more intimate and committed with someone, I do think it's important to share. And I think you're right. If that person, if you, I don't say like, hey, can you show me a bank statement? And and look, it's okay to say like, I make a lot of money. You don't need to worry about paying for things. But if you were going to actually like, again, enter into a legal contract American with shit. them or have a child with them for which you're both legally responsible, at that point, I think you have a right to get some information. Yeah, absolutely. And um, even more than that, like on top of how much do you make, what are your attitudes about money? How do you like yes. to spend? How do you like to save? What's important to you? Do you want to prioritize first class flights and five-star hotels? Or do you want to prioritize, you know, a- retirement? the yeah, retirement and things like that. And I mean, I'm not great at this. I don't want to act like I'm great at the money conversation. It has been a huge problem in my relationships before I will skirt the issue for a long time to the point that I am very angry and there is almost no way to bring it up. I, I don't want, you know, we can give all the advice in the world about, you know, having the conversation, but it's, it's, I want to just acknowledge it's, it's really hard. It's yes. been hard for me and it's really tough and it has ended relationships for me. And maybe had I tried a little harder in the beginning, at least to express my anger, my frustration, the inequality. It or your, or your expectations going in. Mm-hmm. Sure. And I think sometimes we as women, if we're making more, try to smooth it all over by paying for it or use this credit card when we go to my go out for dinner with these friends of mine, you, it'll look like you're paying that. I mean, do whatever you're going to do. But yeah. the thing is, an honest communication about what everybody's expectations are, because why should you get such feelings of resentment and be so pissed off? It may be a little bit his fault. Maybe he should know. But like in defense of the men. They're not mind readers. And we if, it, if the genders were reversed, nobody would say boo about it. I mean, if he was constantly paying for dinners and whatever else, nobody would think that was weird. So why do we get upset if we're constantly paying for dinners? Well, I don't know, but but I'm upset. So let's talk about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I think there's a world in which someone makes so much more that uh, honestly, they could pay for everything. It wouldn't even put a dent in their finances, but the other person, it, it would. And that's a matter of like, okay, well, we're going on this trip. You got to get the Ubers or something. Like right. it's just, that's where the open communication has to happen because Raina and I both dealt with this. And again, she it was kind of a reason for a breakup that she had. And that's where it comes down to like, but I don't want him to know that I'm making this extra 
knocks him out because then he will kind of think he's on a free ride, but I don't want that either. I wish he would pull his weight a little bit more, but that's <laughs> again, that's just like communication about what you can contribute and what feels comfortable for me. Yeah. Right. No, we're spiraling. No, we I, just, no I, I, I think the money thing is important. And if I could like hit the pause button and go back in time, I would have said in a nice way early on in this particular relationship, I'd like you to offer to split stuff with me sometimes. I'd like right. you to be more honest with me about what you could contribute. I'd like some more emphatic excitement when I do pay for stuff that you right. can contribute to. And I'm really, you get to a point where you've paid for so much and this has just become the scenario between mm-hmm. the two of you. And you can't be like, well, I've been mad at you for three months and you've just been using me. <laughs> the person's like, well, what the fuck? Why do you mention right. this? And then let's mention one more thing, which is the fact that even if everything is cool and you totally do say, I make enough money, I want to go on this nice vacation, I'm happy to pay for it. I'd be paying for it anyway. It doesn't cost more for me to have you in the room or order one more chicken. <laughs> yes. You know, it's okay. But then at some point, many, many men, through no fault of their own, start to feel really, really not okay about that. Mm-hmm. And then they start feeling like, well, who am I and what am I contributing? And am I a loser? And then they start resenting your wealth and your career. We know. And that's not <laughs> so like, again, we, we, we have a difficult time and there's no easy fix for it. But if you're not communicating about it throughout, you're going to find yourself in a situation where either you're going to break up before you get married or you're going to get married. And then you're going to be paying this asshole fucking support, which is really a disaster it's such a nightmare. We had a family member that that happened. She started her business when they were married. And I mean, I I, I was shocked and I was shocked that he was like taking it, you know? And why should that be that way? I mean, it really yeah. isn't fair, but we are, I mean, even, mm-hmm. you know, in this day and age, we're still like, Oh my God, I can't believe that you would like take money from her. You're a dude. You have no, penis. no kids. How could you do that? Right. And no kid, no kid. Like it was just yeah. like, it was, it was, it's the law. Um, and I also just want to say, before we move on from this, I know that it is a double standard. I know if men have paid for everything mm-hmm. women have done for hundreds of years, I understand it, but I don't know. That doesn't mean it makes me feel good when somebody takes advantage of me and I'm navigating these new waters because these are different times. But also like, I don't feel comfortable with a guy paying for my whole life. No, ever. I'm so, like, how do I get that way? Like <laughs> early on in the podcast, I was like, I can't wrap my head around a married couple. And again, this is what a lot of people do. And it's, it's no shade. I can't put myself in the shoes of making no money and you have to like ask your husband for money like right. you're, he like he pays for you like he's your dad like he right. like can I have money can I have some money I like right, right at, quoted me for months of me being like Ashley, can I have some money have any money <laughs> like I can't wrap my head around it remember the scene from Goodfellas where she he, she says she wants some money and he goes like this and yes. then she's like more like this and then she has to bend down and give him a blowjob yeah, as a result of wanting scene. this yes. yes one thing to know is that most relationships whether it's your guy you know, business relationship or romantic relationships, there is some kind of a deal. There is, I mean, it's Mm -hmm. okay. There Mm -hmm. is some kind of a deal and everybody knows what the terms of the deal are and everybody should be able to communicate the terms of the deal. You see these like, you know, gorgeous women with these ugly men. Okay. (laughs) There's a deal there, you know, or (laughs) vice. I mean, let's be real about it and it's okay. And then he comes home and goes, I lost my job as president of whatever movie studio. And she's like, peace out because I don't I, the deal was Deal's over you yeah. made the money or you know or b- bad plastic surgery gone wrong and he's like I'm sorry I gotta go get the newer younger model that's the deal and that I do think as long as we're communicating about it and if the deal changes get back in with a therapist you mentioned something in some of your notes about like having a third party there I think that's important not as a, a witness but just a neutral third party that can be like now hold up guys you said this was the deal, but you didn't mention this. And having that third person is often helpful when you are going through whatever kind of a mediation it is, either during the marriage or as a split up. And having those kind of third parties to help guide you, I think is really helpful because they also help you figure out how to better communicate. For sure. Yeah. Should we talk about divorce? Let's talk about divorce. I read a little bit about your book and you know why people decided to divorce, which um, I think it's obvious there's a million reasons why, but something that you brought up in the book that I thought was really interesting was that like some people will come to you for years, multiple times before they retain counsel and they're just kind of like, I don't know. What's the word I'm looking for? Floating, getting their ducks in a row. The idea? Yeah. Or just, yeah. yeah. I and know, getting so. information. What are they? Have? Sober curious. They're divorce curious. They're divorce trying to curious. figure out like what it's going to look like. And so- right. 
One thing that doesn't happen quite as much anymore because now we have amazing resources online. So you don't have to go sit in a divorce lawyer's office to get all the information. You may want to do that once or twice to see if you like him or her. And you can imagine working with that person, but you can go online. And I say this to everybody that's, well, not only thinking about marriage, but thinking about divorce, find out what the law is. What is it going to look like if you get divorced? Is, or do you live in a community property state or an equitable distribution state? Figure out those things and, and see and divorce is scary. And it doesn't matter if you make a ton of money and you're rich and famous and you're like worried, oh my God, who am I going to go to the Oscars with or walk the red carpet with? Or if it's like the firm picnic or, you know, the company Christmas party, it's for you, it's all relative. And so thinking through how scary it's going to be, how are my kids going to be? How are they going to do when it comes to this? Are they going to be okay? And I will say this, we've really evolved in terms of children and how schools handle, you know, split ups. And as long as you're being able to be mature about it, your kids will generally be okay with it. And we figure out ways to evolve and deal with it together. But I think that, yes, getting education about it's important. And, you know, look, it's pretty simple. You've got your custody piece, okay, that you're going to figure out where are they going to live and how far apart are you guys going to live? Are they, where are they going to go to school? What nights do you have, et cetera? The kid piece of it's one thing you figure that out, whatever. And then you basically got two other pieces of it, which are going to be your assets, dividing them up and your debts and then the support. So what I always say to people is imagine there's four corners. Okay. You've got what you have, what you owe, what you earn, what you make, and what you spend. And those are the four corners of any kind of a division of a marriage, because you're going to have to figure out how to divide your assets, divide your debts. Then if you're dividing your assets, you figure out how much you have to live on and then what you make and what you spend. And that's really one way of thinking about, okay, how, what am I going to have if this ends up going sour? How do I figure it out? And that's why we created at divorce.com these kind of like schedules to go through. And so you can really look at it and think, okay, this is how we're going to end up. And you could make kind of a proposal to somebody saying, I will take less of our assets. I will take maybe more of our debt, but I'm going to need more support from you since you're working and you make mm -hmm. more than I do for a certain period of time. And here's all my expenses. I'm not going to have our house, so I don't need to pay mortgage, but I will need enough for rent and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Or like Sex and the City, Charlotte just got the, the townhouse. Um, I always think of Sex and the City. Um, and divorce.com, is there, is, is every state on there and what, what it looks like state yes. by state? I just, every I think this state. is like one of the most prime takeaways of this episode is look at what the fuck is going on where you live. I think sometimes people don't ever think about that. And they, they think like, oh, well, I know my friend got a divorce or got married or got a prenup in the state that you have a totally different set of, of laws. Correct. It is shocking to me because my dad got a divorce in Texas mm -hmm. um, this year and he, he got divorced from my mother in Pennsylvania. So totally different <laughs> laws. Um, and I was, like you were talking about Texas is specifically hard on women. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, my dad's wife was the worst and she had an affair and fuck her. So I mean, whatever, <laughs> but, and we can leave this in the episode. I'm fine with it. Uh, but I was <laughs> shocked by the divorce law in Texas because it is so vastly different than other states. And that was my first sort of foray into realizing like if you're married for under X amount of years, you get less money and things like that. I just, I never knew this stuff. So it is vastly different. Yes. Yeah, so that's the first thing as you're trying to figure out, do I actually take this plunge? Absolutely. Look at the law in your state and figure it out. And maybe yes. Like if you're, if you can't get what you need online, call a couple of divorce attorneys and see if they're willing to meet with you for free. Some of us ask for consultation fee. We don't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sit down. It's the most surreal experience mm -hmm. ever to sit in a divorce lawyer's office. You're like, I cannot believe I'm sitting here. Mm -hmm. And if the divorce attorney isn't able to kind of conscientiously walk you through that, you know, and know that it's difficult. If they're just kind of like, this is what I do. It's been an hour, get out, whatever. That's not a good person for you. You don't need a best friend and you don't need a counselor because we clearly at our hourly rates are not qualified mental health professionals. Mm -hmm. Most of us are hot messes, but, but <laughs> we have to at least have some compassion for what you're going through. Mm -hmm. And if the person you're sitting in front of doesn't, that may not be the right person for you. I, I think that's probably one of the main type of attorneys you could ever need that you want compassion. <laughs> yeah. Like it's, but also yeah. not so much so that yeah. like they're calling to chat and see how your date yeah. went because they're billing you for that. So that's <laughs> weird too. Like, you know. You have friends. You don't need her yeah. to be calling about yeah. that. Yeah. When, so when somebody comes in to see you for that consultation, they're like, I can't believe I'm here, which I'm sure that everybody says that. Like, I can't believe I'm sitting here. What are some other things that like you say really often that people are surprised by or information people need like day one? 
time heals. I say so often to people, you know, you and I, you will speak to me whether we're done or not on May 3rd, 2023. And I promise you, you'll be feeling better than you are now. It's, it's new, it's raw, it's mm -hmm. scary. Time heals. You, you have to go through a transition and tra just transitions are generally scary. I can't promise you it's going to be better than it is now, but it's going to be different. And it will mm -hmm. certainly be less painful than it is now. And I think people need to really hear that. Um, also, the other thing I say a lot is your kids will be fine. Your kids mm -hmm. will be fine. I've got two kids. I split up with, they have two different dads. I split it up with each of their dads when they were two. My kids are really easy. I get along with both of their dads. We do mm -hmm. family things all together. Mm -hmm. If you're okay, your kids will be okay. And as mad as you might be at your spouse for being a shitty spouse, he or she can probably still be a great parent or mm -hmm. at least an okay parent. And kids are much better off having relationships with both of their parents even if they're not great relationships, unless there's really like abuse or molestation, sure. they should be able to make a decision of their own about how much they want to spend with their parents as they get older. Not when they're kids. When they're kids, you got to see your dad. Sorry, you don't mm -hmm. like it. If he's not hurting you, you got to go over there and see him. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you have to be able to say that to your kids. Right. Yes. And we can't weaponize our children against our ex-spouse. It's that's how you, that's how you get fucked up kids. Yeah. Um, and kids know, they know that they're yeah. part of each of you. So if you're talking shit about their other parent, they're absorbing that and they're feeling that that somehow is directed at them. They mm -hmm. have to. So we had a, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up here, but we had a thing that we would just discuss before you walked away that we wanted to settle. Settle a bet. Um, what is, what exactly is an annulment and when does it apply? Okay. So, and again, I don't know every state I know in California because I actually had an annulment of that 14 months, which probably wasn't totally kosher, but because I was okay. doing it myself, I could, they're a little stricter oh, okay. now than they used to be back in the nineties with annulments, but okay. an annulment means, and this isn't a Catholic church annulment. This is a legal annulment. Okay. I don't they know anything about the Catholic things. church. Okay. They are different. Yeah. If you get an annulment in the Catholic church, I don't know. Cause I'm Jewish. I have no idea. Okay. But in, in, in law, an annulment means your marriage never happened. Never happened. Which right. You have to have a basis for it then. Okay. And people are like, oh, I've been married under a year. I can get an annulment. Not true. The basis for an annulment is either fraud, um, mental competence. You were mentally ill. And, and so therefore you couldn't enter into a contract to get married or you weren't the age of consent, which also would be fraud. If you weren't actually 18 years old, you can't get married. But if you said you were, or your parents kind of sold you into marriage or something like that. So those are the three things that you can get out of a, of a marriage. So there, but it's complicated because let's say you're getting an annulment. This is my situation. I got an annulment in 1994 after getting married in 1993. It means our marriage never happened. And yet our picture hung at the Bel Air Hotel <laughs> for about four years after that. So our marriage clearly happened. But if we had purchased anything or even made any money during that 14 months, that would have been community property. To, so to say oh. it didn't happen is very difficult. You have to like turn back time and put everything back to where it was. So that's why most courts don't grant an annulment unless there's those three kind of weird circumstances. And the fraud has to be pretty bad. Can it be like this person said he had a bunch of money? Like, can it be like they conned you in a way? Yes. I mean, it, it would have to be a bad con. You're not supposed to want to marry somebody just because they have a lot of money. But if it turned uh, yeah. out that everything he said was, was disingenuous, yeah. he didn't only not have a lot of money, but you were going to have to end up paying for him and this, that, and the other. Yeah. I would imagine. And it's up to a judge whether he or she grants the annulment, but that would probably do it. Could it be if you were like, like incapacitated in Vegas? Like, I feel like that's what I think of an annulment. Well, like, yes, but that's why they're mind. getting, that's why they're getting a little bit stricter about it. Cause they don't want people to just come in and be like, I was fucked up. You know, yeah, they're yeah, like, well, for you, sure. you, you, you somehow managed to get the words I do out, you yeah, know, uh -huh. if you have the pictures that they had in the hangover at the end, then nobody remembered <laughs> anything because they were blacked yeah. out. Maybe you couldn't know that. I don't know. Okay. I thought it was just a religious thing. So in, a, in the religious sense, it means like in the eyes of God, it didn't happen. Like it's only the right. Catholic church. Church. I'm a Jew, right. so I, it's not. Yeah, I was thinking too. of like Ross and Rachel. Like that's like you know the adult, the whole thing of on friends. So I was just we were curious. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. But see, the Jew, there's there's no annulment for Jews. They'll never let you forget. <laughs> <laughs> Big guilt. Big, Big I guilt. got you a blender in 1993. You didn't send it back. There's no annulment. Oh my yes, God. Jewish guilt. We're so, <laughs> so big on funny. it. Um. Well, I thought the, I think the divorce advice is really great. Just yeah. you know, have the conversation, have a consultation, maybe have a counselor mediate. Mm -hmm. Um, and I love this. I love it. Kids came up a lot because I am the product of divorce and my parents both co-parented really beautifully mm -hmm. and didn't, you know, they fucked me up in other ways, but not because they hated <laughs> each other. No, I mean, I will say I'm here to say, because I've watched it not only personally, but professionally.
family for many years, it's doable. You can have healthy children with healthy relationship goals growing up in two different families. And so if it's doable and if a divorce lawyer is saying it's doable, you have that has to have a grain of salt with it. So I think that mm-hmm. that's something that we should, and this is why I always talk about the evolution of dissolution. We have to get better at this. It's happening. We can't mm-hmm. just keep turning a blind eye. And I think if people go into marriages being aware of what the laws are in their state and how it affects them and how to communicate. One, we'll have longer lasting marriages, but two, we'll have situations where if the marriage ends, people are healthier and they're raising healthier kids. Mm -hmm. That's my jam. I love it. Um, I wish you were here all day long. (laughs) I know we can talk to you forever. Um, Well, thank you so much. This was, this was incredible. I'd love this conversation so much. We both love this conversation. Do you want to tell us where everybody can find everything about you. I mean, obviously divorce.com. Everything and, about yeah, me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> divorce.com. I'm there. And then I'm, my Insta is Laura Wasser official. I don't do a lot of tweeting or Facebooking or anything else, but I have Instagram and of course, divorce.com where there, you can learn anything you need to know about divorce in your state. You can process a divorce inexpensively. We're here to help you. And again, search the web. Like there's all kinds of resources available that there weren't before in terms of mm-hmm. childcare providers and financial planners. There, will, there are people that can help you start your next chapter so it's not so bleak. And, you know, then you have your friends and your family. So if you are going through it, don't despair. This is just one chapter in the book of your life. It's all going to be good. And if you're kind of nervous to tell your partner you want to divorce them, just leave divorce.com up on your computer when they walk in. They'll see and they'll get the hit. <laughs> leave Laura's business card on their book. Well, my book next to your bed. Your I book, hope you yeah. tell me that that was there. Lots of subtle <laughs> hints to drop. Um, okay. Well, thank you again so much. This was wonderful. And uh, we love chatting with you. Yes. Thank you Thanks, so much. Thanks, guys. So nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Bye. And you guys know where to find us. You can get merchandise and tickets to our shows and sign up for the newsletter and everything else at girlsgottoeatpodcast.com or Girls Gotta Eat Podcast on Instagram. I am Ash Hess on all social medias. Raina is Raina.greenberg and girls underscore gotta eat on Twitter. And we'll see you next week. Have a good week, guys. Bye.